I woke up uh, still in the gray jumpsuit from the night before. My arm was tingling as I pushed myself up. All I could see was colorful fabric. A couch. Yes, I was probably on a couch. I sat up and uh, looked around. Oh, right. This was Rosalita's place. It has a familiar layout. Most of the space station economy housing was laid out similarly. As I was taking in the hand-glazed pottery and plates, the colorful and gilded hollow photos on the wall, a thunder of noise came flying at me out of the hallway. I was tackled by a small poof of white, pink, and green fur. Titch, get back here! A young boy skidded to a halt, eyes wide as he realized a stranger was now holding his fluffy little dog. Hi, I said, smiling. I'm Maeve. Titch seems to really like me. He was trying to lick my face at the moment. I put the squirming dog back on the floor where he zoomed around in little circles. Are you Tia's friend? I watched him size me up. He reminded me of my little brother, Balin. A pang of homesickness washed over me. Is Rosalita your Tia? I asked and got a nod from the boy before both him and the dog dashed back out of the room. Embarrassed, I got up and was starting to scope out the door to leave by when I was interrupted. Leaving so soon? Rosalita was leaning on the counter in the kitchen. Her hair messy, her work jumpsuit half unzipped, a large mug of coffee being filled from the dispenser. You'll miss out on mi abuela's chiquitas roja. She turned and started walking away, looking over her shoulder. You coming? I shrugged, following her down a short hallway with a few doors. Each door seemed decorated with hollow drawings of color and moving photos and multiple names like Rico, Angel, Sophie, Estella, and Luna. Mi familia, Rosalita said, shrugging. We passed a couple more undecorated doors before reaching hers. She had sanded down the paint on the walls to expose the metal, polishing so light reflected back. There were these long floor-to-ceiling panels, a meter wide of a deep maroon, almost black. A hollow window showed a looping video of canyon racing, and she had three framed blueprints on the wall. A comfortable bed with a plush headboard in dark velvety material was paired with welded metal tables. Wow, was all I could say. It felt like we'd been transported to an imperial luxury suite. I walked up to one of the blueprints on the metal panel. I noticed the light was actually coming from behind the cloth panels. Where did you get these? Oh, I made them. She had pulled aside a curtain to a small closet of clothes and shoes and a mirror with jewelry up and down the sides of the cabinet. A section of worn and scuffed work clothes stood out amidst the color and shine. I bet this would suit you. She was holding up a piece of mossy green fabric to me. Just throw it on over top. I pulled the top over my head and glanced around her to my reflection in the mirror. It was beautiful, and it kind of made my eyes stand out. She stepped aside, letting me see the way it draped perfectly around my body. Beautiful, she said, smiling at me, and I felt myself blush. Then her tone got more brusque. Let's go. Shift starts in 20 and I can't be late. It was over breakfast something happened that would shape my journey as a pilot. Amid the chaos of people all gathered around the long table that had been lowered out of its storage spot in the ceiling, a surly man who seemed to be Rosalita's brother-in-law was complaining in rapid-fire Spanish about the news. A younger member of the family with bright makeup and gender-neutral features and clothing argued back in Universal. Dav's hope was just corporate, cutting cost. All those people who died would have been saved. I searched my memory. I seemed to remember the incident they were talking about. I was still a young kid, but my family had talked about it since. I thought that was a tragic cave-in. My quiet voice cut through the noise like a knife, and everyone turned to look at me. 
Rosalita turned with an, oh, honey, look on her face. Don't believe what the feeds tell you. You're our pilot. Go out there and get your history from the source. You're a pilot? Every kid in the room suddenly wanted me to tell them what it was like to fly. On our dash back to the docks, Rosalita didn't pull her punches. Maeve, I know you're new to the bubble. My one piece of advice to you is be wary. Everyone has an agenda, and everyone is looking out for their own interests. I sighed. <sighs> You're not the first to say that. When we parted, she pulled me into a tight hug. Be careful out there. She squeezed my arms, and then turned to head off to the outfitting section. A few of her co-workers catcalled her, and uh, she just flipped them off. I changed into my jumpsuit in the pilot's lockers on the dock. Using the public showers was still a little weird to me. This particular station had only opaque dividers between the stalls. I tried not to watch the silhouettes of my fellow pilots scrubbing and washing and doing whatever they were doing in the shower. Back in my sidewinder, I put out a general ping to those I had winged with the day before. I'm heading out to Dav's Hope. We'll be collecting scans on the way if any of you would like to join me. I didn't get a response from Zara. Not that I expected to. Keegan immediately accepted the wing request, followed by Night Ranger, which surprised me. There is something about being in space that is freeing... In the station, I'm awkward and clumsy. My ship is just slippery and shifty. But when I'm in super cruise, it all comes together. Scanning systems, seeing the infinite combination the galaxy has. Well, it just feels right to me. We made good time, arriving in the system by midday. I scarfed down a zero-G lunch, barely noticing the nasty texture. I felt apprehension set in as I mapped the planet. Was I even allowed to visit this site? People died here. Was landing over their graves disrespectful? I'm going down, I said over the comms, getting affirmatives back from both wingmates. I didn't want to tell them I had never landed on a planet without a landing pad before. I have never taken out the planetary vehicle that came with my ship. Something seemed off the minute I landed. The buildings were covered in years of dust. We weren't alone, either. There were a number of other pilots circling the site. Keegan, why are so many people here? I asked over the comms. His response was slower to come than normal. It's an important piece of history. Many people come to pay their respects or learn more about what happened here like we are. He didn't exit his ship like I had, just hovered kicking up dust. I slowly rolled the SRV towards the gate saying, Dav's Hope, and almost didn't notice Keegan's message. I can't stay. Meet me at a sire base when you're finished. Night Ranger, on the other hand silently landed, and started through the abandoned buildings, not seeming phased by the eerie silence of the place. The first thing that caught my eye was the data tower. It raised up as I approached. I fumbled with my controls, finally managing to figure out the scanner and to retrieve the logs. If you've never been there, and you've never heard the original recordings, I'll just tell you, it's heartbreaking. Base, do you read us? The frightened voice of trapped miners last words stick with me even now. There are plenty of miners to take their place, was the corporate liaison's harsh words after telling the site coordinator to pull up and abandon the project. Honestly, it left me with more questions than answers. What project was more valuable than human life? Why did the history feeds and news stories paint a heroic attempt to rescue them by the corporation when, in truth, not a single thing was done? I was startled by a message coming in from a pilot circling the site. They were broadcasting to all the surface. Scavengers! Sightseers! Their voice was harsh. 
You should be ashamed of yourselves. Leave the dead in peace. My heart racing, I got back in my ship as quick as I could, and I wanted to get out of here. I headed to the only base in the system to meet up with Keegan. Landing on the pad amidst a puff of dust, I took a few calming breaths. Trying to shake the feeling from that abandoned site. Walking around felt so strange. I still wasn't used to the heavy pull of a planet. Even though it was less than a G here, it still feels odd to me. I pinged Keegan, but instead of a response, a pre-written message popped up into my inbox. Maeve, I have to go. I have something to deal with. I'll be back in touch soon. I quickly read the rest of the letter. Apparently, he had grown up in a settlement not unlike Dav's Hope. A terrible accident had happened, killing dozens of miners. The children and families of the miners couldn't grieve their lost loved ones. We couldn't fail our quota. If we didn't deliver, the corporation would extract value from us as slaves. His story went on. I felt hot tears rolling down my cheeks as I imagined a boy having just lost his parents to a cave-in. One of the remaining miners taught us kids to mine. Suiting us up in oversized low-G suits, you can only guess how that went. My vision was blurry as I read the rest of his story. His friend slipped with the laser, severing his own leg. Not stopping there, the cutter swung towards Keegan. His sister, Tarania, saved his life by using her own body to shield him from the deadly beam. It still cut his neck deeply, severing his vocal cords. He was seven. This is a dark and scary world, and you are a bright spot among the stars. His message ending with the parting words, I fear you will have to face that darkness one day, but I will help you fight it if I can. I'll be back. I was stunned, sitting there staring out at the stars above. Well, no wonder he hadn't been able to stay. Both of these stories of Keegan's home and Dab's hope painted a world in which corporate pockets were padded with credits at a great cost to life. The thing that bothered me wasn't that the people had died. Instead, it was that their story had been covered up, erased. Hi, Mom! I waved at the grainy image of my mother in our house. Sorry, I haven't called earlier. She put her hands on her hips in a stance I knew well. Oh, Maeve, such a fancy pilot who's already forgotten the people who raised her. Now, Hashery, don't scare our daughter off already. My father's smiling face came into focus beside my mother's. How are you doing? I tried to smile convincingly, but my face fell a bit. It's a lot, Pa. Flying is challenging, and there's so much I still have to learn about ships. I swiped across some pictures I had taken of things I'd seen. But I love it! There's so many things to see, and the Earth-like worlds are unbelievable. My mother's eyes narrowed, but she didn't say anything. Instead, my lanky brother draped himself over my parents, face jutting forward. Hey, sis! Have you seen a cutter yet? What's the biggest ship you've piloted? When are you coming home so I can fly with you? <laughs> I laughed at his enthusiasm. I haven't seen a cutter yet, but I have seen a Type 9. They're as big as an asteroid. His grin widened ear from ear as my mother batted him away. The ping of homesickness tugged at my heart as I heard the sounds of my family in the background almost smelling the curry on the stove. My older siblings mostly still lived with us, their kids already growing up. Do you need us to send you any credits? My dad said, worried. I know we weren't able to send you off with much, but we could probably send a couple hundred by next week. No, no, Pa. Actually, I'm transferring back what everyone put in for the ship, plus a little bit. I watched his brow furrow, 
and continued on quickly. I've been mapping systems and selling data. You wouldn't believe how much I've made already. Now, Maeve, don't be flashing those credits around willy-nilly, he scolded. Pirates and grifters are everywhere in the bubble. Be careful, my girl. He was called by someone in the background and left the frame. My mother's worry was showing on her face. Something's wrong, she prompted me. I just visited Dav's Hope, and it's not like the news feed said. I watched her face register a couple of different emotions before going stoic. I wish I could do something to help people like those miners. You have a big heart, my girl, she smiled sadly at me. But don't forget to take care of yourself before you try and solve the world's problems. Yes, Mom, I said. Then the conversation turned to her updating me on what had happened since I had left. It was soothing to hear about who was doing what, the daily happenings of trade, of mined materials. After ending the call, there wasn't enough time for me to go back out scanning systems, so I decided to take the SRV out and explore the base. My head clearing, I knew I had to stay focused on what matters, getting my family out from underneath the Pilots' Federation boot. But part of me knew it was a lot bigger than that. I would have to stay vigilant and learn what I could 